to be um, their jobs, careers, um, and they're all tied to the environment. Water, air, wildlife, uh, our, our living earth, our, we pay special attention to them on Earth Day. And uh, it's great that we're, we get to hear from these amazing panelists. Um, but First Nations peoples have a very special relationship with the earth. So I thought it would be fitting if we start off the day today by hearing directly from Jamie Leving, who's going to do a, a little keynote introduction to everyone, um, as well as our land acknowledgement. So I'll pass things over to Jamie right now. Okay, hello, can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by uh, introducing myself, I guess, in my Algonquin language. So I'll explain that after, um, but uh, here we go. So Kwe Kwe, Jamie Laving, Indigenous Cause, Kawin, Nidodem Sinun, Kirigan Zibi, Nidonjaba, Odawa, and Dayan. Uh, so what I just said or what that translates to is, hello, my name is Jamie Laving. Uh, my community is Kitigan Zibi, and I currently live in Ottawa. Uh, I'd like to start off the meeting today by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, the Algonquin people have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to be able to present on this territory. Um, I am also honored to have been asked to speak to you all today on this very special day about environmental careers. I'd like to wish everyone a happy International Mother Earth Day. Um, it's an important day, and it was established back in 2009 by the United uh, Nations General Assembly and is celebrated worldwide to remind each and every one of us that uh, the earth and all of its ecosystems provide us with life and sustenance. Uh, for Indigenous people, it is much more critical as we experience the most extreme burdens of climate change. Uh, these changes have threatened our economic, our cultural and our spiritual practices. And as the first true environmentalist of Turtle Island, Indigenous people have perpetually had a close relationship with the land and water. Uh, we believe in a reciprocal relationship with the earth that must be continuously nurtured and respected. Uh, and we also operate under the basic understanding that if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. So now that uh, there's pollution that's happening on our lands and water, it has quite literally changed the way that Indigenous people interact with the environment. Um, and as a First Nations woman, I can tell you that Mother Earth is important to me, especially when we speak about water. So we don't consider water to be a resource uh, that can be bought or sold. Rather, when we think of water, we, we think of it more of a, like a relative or a teacher, or it uh, provides medicine and acts as a healer to us. For Indigenous women, uh, that connection deepens even more uh, through our role as child bearers. So just as water from Mother, Mother Earth carries us to life, we as women also carry life and water in our womb during pregnancy. So it's in this way that we recognize that all aspects of creation are interrelated. Um, in my culture, water is known as a woman's responsibility. And as women, we're also known as the carriers of water. Um, Sometimes you'll also hear about water being referred to or considered to be Mother Earth's blood. Um, in this way, we, we talk about the rivers um, being considered to be the veins that carry blood throughout the body. And uh, in order to have the, the body function properly, we need the blood to be clean and we need it to flow smoothly. Um, so just, I guess, quickly circling back to why we're here today, environmental careers are really important. And I encourage you all to consider a career that involves environment in some way, shape or form. Um, the health of Mother Earth is critical to all of our survival. And I'm sure you've all heard there is no plan B and we don't have much time to get it right. 
So I know that sci science classes are, are tough, school's tough, but stick with it, uh, do your best. And the great thing about environmental careers is that the possibilities uh, are virtually endless. There's so many different areas that you can go into um, and it continually grows. It's steadily growing as we speak. So I'm sure that all of the people on the panel today will tell you that uh, a career in the environment can be highly rewarding. And I hope you find it interesting and that you feel inspired after the conversation today. Uh, so with that, I'll say miigwech, which means thank you. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Jamie. And um, we will we will be uh, circling back to you to hear a little bit more about your career path. So it's going to be a casual conversation today. I'd, I'd like um, each of the panelists to start off by introducing themselves and telling us what it is that you do in your job or the different jobs you've had in your career. And we'll just we'll start off there. So um, Luke, I'm going to put you on the on the spot as a as a veteran to introduce yeah. yourself to uh, this group. Yeah, sure thing, no problem. Yeah, so hi everybody. My name is Luke Ehler. I am the assistant manager for the Wild Outside program with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, so this is a new youth leadership program that we've just started up uh, last year. So it's we've just turned about a year old now. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, I'm tuning in from Calgary, Alberta today, also known as Mokinsis, um, and which is the also known as Tree Seven Territory, home of the Blackfoot. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a little west of where most of you are tuning in from today, but hopefully, I can still provide some uh, some valuable input. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm especially happy to be joining you here on Earth Day, uh, as Jamie and uh, uh, Christina were just saying. It's a very, very important day. Um, it's a really great day to celebrate and honor the earth, uh, but it's also a great day for us to reflect on our own personal relationship with the earth and how our own actions might be influencing uh, and impacting the earth. So I guess that's just to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am originally from Nova Scotia uh, and my background is in sort of environmental education and wildlife conservation. Um, and uh, I got sort of into that field really through my interest uh, as a kid in just being outdoors, exploring the woods, you know, getting my pants full of grass stains, uh, all that sort of stuff. So uh, that was where I had my interest. Um, and then eventually, as I got older, that interest turned into a passion uh, to learn more about the earth and how it functioned. I was just so fascinated by wondering why the ants were going single file down a log or why certain clouds looked different or moved differently than other clouds. I was just so fascinated by everything that was going on around me uh, and wanted to learn more about it. So that eventually inspired me to go to university and study environmental science. Uh, I thought I wanted to just do research and learn more and more and more about the environment. Um, and I can touch a little bit more on this later, but as I was going through my degree, um, I sort of made a pivot and switched over to thinking maybe science isn't something I want to do. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the work, but education was really the thing that spoke to me. And so I actually made a pivot midway through my degree to switch more to a focus on education. Um, and I've had a, you know, a lot of great experiences um, working either directly with animals and wildlife rehabilitation, um, uh, working in doing field work and studies. Um, I got to do work with Parks Canada, um, studying the invasive green crabs uh, that were there. And I also got to work with Bird Studies Canada, um, studying uh, or monitoring the breeding habitats of the endangered piping plovers uh, along beaches in Nova Scotia. So I've had some great opportunities there and have also had the chance to go to some uh, international conferences and um, um, like climate summits and all that sort of stuff as well. Uh, and I'm also happy today to talk about all of the Canadian Wildlife Federation programs that might be relevant to the folks that are attending. So much exciting information to to soak in. Um, we'll we'll move on to some of the other panelists to uh, get them to introduce themselves and um, 
I think you guys will start to see the there are some common threads um, among everyone and not just because they're all tied or related to the environment. I'm going to flip over to Joshua now. Josh, could you introduce yourself? Um, tell us a little, little bit about you and what it is that you do, because I don't think I quite understand it either. Oh, don't worry. I, I still don't fully understand what I do sometimes <laughs> as well. But um, so hi, everyone. My name is Joshua, um, Joshua Wien, and I work as an environmental consultant for a consulting firm, SLR. And right now I'm actually at a job site out in London, Ontario. It's a former military base that was actually appropriated by the government of Canada um, from the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point First Nations. And um, my work for the past six to eight months has actually been involved with helping clean up some of the soil and some of the contaminants on site, such as um, contaminants in groundwater and surface water and um, soil, mostly in some of the building foundations in order to help return the land to their rightful owners. And um, I'm actually proud to be a part of such a large project. And um, it gives me a lot of joy knowing that we've actually just installed a couple of um, temp housings um, for some of the residents on site and they just moved in. So now they have electricity, they have water, they have utilities and they're able to live a much more comfortable lifestyle than they've um, previously been living. And my work takes me to various sites, um, but it really comes down to helping to clean up um, the mess that we, have, we as people have left and to hopefully return it to like a good quality for um, future generations. And education wise, I actually started off in um, the sciences as a classic science student, um, thought I wanted to go to med school, but then my mom always forbade me from getting mud on my pants, <laughs> just like with uh, Luke and with grass stains. So then of course in my rebellious phase, I ended up going camping a lot. I spent a lot of time outdoors and then realized I wanted to spend most of my time outside. And then eventually I pivoted to more of an environmental earth sciences program. And it has taken me from Toronto to the Caribbean, to Northern Ontario, to out West in BC. And right now I'm uh, living in Ottawa. Well, sometimes when I'm not here on site and um, yeah, it's, it's taken me all around the world and I have enjoyed every single moment of it, knowing that I am helping to improve the quality of the environment any how I can. Josh, just a, a follow up question. Could you please tell us what sort of contaminants or how these contaminants are getting into the ground that you're doing these studies on? Yeah, so for this site specifically, since it was in um, it was used as a training um, military base. We have contaminants that could be things such as um, unexploded ordinances, like um, old explosives. We have, um, say, leaching from like um, old paint cans or from like the old infirmary. Like we're actually working on um, removing as much of the contaminants from the old infirmary on site now. Um, and also just like from spills, right? Just sometimes like you don't even consider like um like a gas tank and then it could have been leaking over the years and then now um we're working towards removing it and cleaning up the soil around it so that people can plant plants and um start harvesting crops as well i'd be totally remiss if i didn't ask you right now ordinance are you worried about getting blown up with uh, these in the ground <laughs> Um, I should be. I definitely should be more so than I am, but I think I'm, I'm one of those uh, type of people that is just so excited about the work that uh, the safety aspect uh, completely goes over my head sometimes. Thank you very much for the intro, Josh. Um, we will be getting back to you with uh, lots of questions. Um, I'd like to move now to Micah. Uh, Micah's just starting his career. He's uh, currently still in university. I'll let him do the, the introduction there. Um, but all throughout high school and even now he's doing his, um, his co-op work placement with Tesla. So 
Micah, I'll pass it over to you to, to introduce yourself. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Micah. Um, I went to high school in Glebe in Ottawa. Uh, that's where I grew up. And as Christina mentioned, right now I am in university. Um, so I'm at the University of Waterloo studying mechatronics engineering. Um, and if that sounds like a long word, it's more uh, mechanical and electrical combined together. Um, so it's a lot of different robotic systems is the, the main way that it's described. Um, so I build robots pretty much, uh, or at least I'm learning how to. <laughs> um, so yeah, and Waterloo has a great co-op program. So they have a um, system where you do four months of school and then four months of work at another company. And then you go back and do four months of school again. So you get lots of work experience throughout your degree. Um, so right now I am working at Tesla and um, one of the great things I love about Tesla is their mission. Uh, their mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And they do that through uh, all different types of green energy products. So energy consumption, they make solar panels uh, and for energy production, they make um, electric vehicles for energy consumption and they make large scale batteries for um, energy storage as well. Um, and my role at Tesla is designing electronic circuits for the cars. Um, so there's a lot of technological background in that. Um, during high school, uh, I was, and through my early years as well, I was very passionate about learning how stuff works and trying to take it apart and figure out um, what exactly all these little bits in here do to try and uh, figure out what it does. Um, and that kind of led me down this path into exploring more into uh, science and engineering and got into uh, technology and electronic circuits. I've kind of moved that down towards the path of mechatronics engineering and working at Tesla. Super cool. He's got way more interesting and more and more stories to to share as well. But we'll we'll see how time plays out here because we want to hear from some of our other panelists as well. Um, Patty and Indigo, are you uh, are you still there? Can you tell us about what you do in your job and how you got there? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I I thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. I think this is really cool for. Patty. Oh, there you are. High school as well. Um, so my name's Patty, and I work at the Ottawa Valley Wild Bird Care Center. And uh, I'm the education coordinator now, but I have worn many different hats in the organization throughout my time there. Uh, Indigo beside me is my sidekick for all my presentations. Uh, he just makes me look better. Uh, he's a, an American kestrel, which is a wild bird uh, throughout North America. He's in the falcon family. So he's kind of like a miniature peregrine falcon. He doesn't get any bigger. Uh, so the, water, the Ottawa Valley Wild Bird Care Center, we take care of any injured or orphaned wild birds that people find. Uh, so we take care of over 4,000 birds every year. And these are just birds in Ottawa that people are finding and bringing to us. So if a bird hits a window, uh, maybe it gets picked up by a predator, falls out of the nest, uh, these are all birds that are brought to our care. So our job is to fix them as quickly and best as we can, whether that's a, a small cast on their broken wing or their leg, we give them medicine for pain uh, and infections, we give them good food and rehabilitate them as, as fast as we can and then release them back to the wild. Um, so although we have lots of birds in care, we are not a, a zoo. Um, these are all wild birds, and that's a very important thing that we need to remember every day, uh, that these are wild animals and we need to respect that and get them back to the, the wild as soon as we can. Indigo is different, though, because he's sitting beside me, and he's a falcon, and he shouldn't be sitting beside me right now. Um, so he's our education ambassador, and what happened to Indigo is that he did break his wing, and someone did find him and they wanted to help, uh, but perhaps they didn't know about the Ottawa Bird Center and they decided to fix the wing on their own. Uh, so this unfortunately is one illegal, we're not allowed to care for wild animals if we don't have permission. And for Indigo, uh, his wing healed a little bit crooked, so the bones weren't properly lined up so he can no longer fly. Uh, so his job right now, and we even need to ask permission to keep him to do this job, is to tell his story, to tell his story to every person that we meet, to let people know that there are organizations that help our wildlife, uh, just like veterinarians help our pets. And 
uh, these are the places that we need to bring our wildlife to so we can get our wildlife back to where they belong. And my story is interesting because I started at the Wild Bird Care Centre as a volunteer at the age of 16. And uh, I was looking at the teachers joining today. I was also a co-op student in my high school. And I believe my uh, old high school co-op student is listening right now. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I always loved birds. I loved nature. And through some adults that helped me, like my co-op teacher, uh, you know, I, I got involved with the Bird Center. And I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had an interest and a willingness to learn. So uh, in my head, I'm like, I want to work with animals, so I'm going to be a vet because that's what everyone thinks. And, um, but once I got to university, my eyes were open to all of these other careers uh, in science. And I was also opened my eyes to the fact that I couldn't memorize very well. So I had a lot of difficulties, um, but that didn't really discourage me from my career in, in science and biology. I just kind of shifted gears a little bit. So I started learning about other animals. I took, um, I did my bachelor's in zoology, so I learned lots of different things about animals and wildlife and plants and fell in love with ecology and research. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to be a research scientist and get out in the field and answer all these questions that I have. Um, so I continued my university at Carleton doing my master's degree, uh, again with birds because that's my passion. Um, but by the time I was done that, I realized, well, research isn't quite for me either because what I really, really like to do is talk. Have you guys figured that out yet? <laughs> um, so that's that's my passion, and and I like to talk to people and uh, get them interested in nature and plant that little seed that you know everyone could do something to help our our mother earth. Everyone could do something and take interest in nature, and maybe that's going to evolve into a career. Uh, maybe that's going to evolve into a hobby. Uh, but uh, whatever it evolves into, I want to be a part of that. So uh, after all of this, after after being starting at 16 and doing all this university stuff, I went back to the Bird Center. I went back to the place that I loved. It is a very small charity here in Ottawa. And I said, hey, I want to start your education program. So now I get to take care of the birds, which is great. Um, I, I still get to be with the birds and learn about the birds and how to care for them. But for the most part, I get to be in the community talking to classrooms and girl guide groups and anyone who will listen to me uh, about birds and how important they are uh, in our world. So, yeah. And if you want to continue learning about birds after today's session, OCSB educators, we are also running a birding webinar tomorrow morning at 9.30, and I believe it is for uh, grade five to grade nine students um, with Bruce DeLabio. I'm not sure if you know uh, Bruce, uh, Patty, yeah. And uh, so we're gonna continue the very specific learning about, about birds in our area at that session as well. And we do hope that our students and our OCSB educators will also join us, joining us in uh, some photographs of birds out there now in spite of all the snow um, with their spring migration and, and use the hashtag OCSB tweet tweet because we thought we'd be pretty cool with that. So um, lots of more learning to continue with um, this Earth Month with OCSB as well on birds. So hope you'll join us for that as well. And you can register for that on the Environmental Stewardship website or the OCSB STEAM website. Enough of the sales pitch, Christina, back to you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Patty, for for sharing that you you already answered one of the questions that the students had was do you have to be a vet to uh, to to do what you do and and no no you don't um, thank you Indigo as well for that lovely show you put on for us I wasn't sure if you were taking flight uh, back there or just showing off I think you were just showing off um, I'd like to hear now from Jamie our keynote because she has uh, an interesting um, tie and and career path as well Jamie back over to you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, with uh, with me, I am actually the director of water uh, at the Assembly of First Nations. Uh, so AFN what is what we call it for short. Uh, it's a national not-for-profit organization that advocates uh, for the rights of First Nations people, uh, peoples across Canada. So we support uh, 634 different First Nations and we work to advance uh, various issues 
from uh, language to economic development, infrastructure and governance. Um, as indicated in my particular sector, I, I work to advocate rights on water. Um, so with that, we speak a lot about uh, title and, and rights, uh, jurisdiction, um, and we also advocate a lot for protection and conservation of water uh, and water stewardship as well. Um, yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time working individually with the, the First Nations as well as uh, the federal government. Um, I haven't been in this role for a very long time. It's a relatively new sector that we've started at AFN. It's only maybe not even a month old, actually. Uh, before that, I worked as the National Climate Change Coordinator in the environment sector, again, at AFN. Um, so it might be more worthwhile for me to kind of speak to some of the work that we, we did in that sector during my time. Um, so just to give you an example of some of the, the things that we work on, like we're currently working with the government right now on uh, things like carbon pricing, uh, which is everyone's favorite topic, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, we're working on a national climate change uh, strategy to be able to guide First Nations across Canada who want to uh, action climate change. Um, yeah, I guess and the story of how I got to be at AFN was uh, a little bit strange, I guess. In, in high school, I wasn't a big fan of science. I always knew that I liked to know how things work and I liked playing with bugs and animals and, and getting my, my pants dirty like, like Luke, getting full of grass stains. Um, yeah, but I wasn't necessarily fond of, of all of the science classes. And I didn't really discover that till later in life. I actually went out into the field and I was working in a completely different field uh, doing insurance. And sitting in an office wasn't my idea of a good time. Um, so I ended up going back to school and I got a college diploma as uh, an environmental protection and compliance technician. And I wasn't quite satisfied with that. So I continued on and I went into university where I got an undergrad um, um, bachelor's degree in science. And I really liked the work that I was able to do there. I got to work with water. So that was what I did as my thesis project. Um, up north, we have uh, a lake that has blue green algae blooms every summer. So that really intrigued me. So I got to spend my summer on the water and doing some experiments, which was really fun. Uh, I moved on past that. I went even further and did a master's degree in environmental science, where again, the focus of my research was on that same body of water and kind of looking at the, the blue-green algae there. Um, yeah, and I guess when I was doing my graduate studies, what made me really interested was I ended up going to uh, Kansas, where I attended a, a workshop on um, getting Indigenous students more involved in STEM programs. So it was actually there that I kind of really got a feel, like understanding, I guess, that I really want to do something in science, but I also want to work and try and help um, First Nations people. So that's, long story short, I basically, that's how I came to be at AFN. So I kind of merged the science and Indigenous people and, and put them together. Can I ask, uh, Amy, if you can, oh, sorry, there's a little bit of feedback going on there because I haven't spoken for a while. Can I ask, Jamie, um, what did you learn when you were studying the algae? What, why is that so important uh, when we're looking at our environment? Well, there's a couple of, well, there's various reasons, um, but this particular body of water is where the mun municipality um, surrounding the lake was getting their, their water from. Um, so it's quite difficult to, to get rid of blue-green algae once it's in the water source and uh, it ended up causing water boil advisories. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. But in the water itself, um, it's not, I guess it, it can be a natural process. It's kind of a complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it can cause things like fish kills. Uh, for fish, it can accumulate in the muscle tissue, and um, it's not advised to consume fish that are in this area. Um, yeah, Which but it's is a shame. Yeah, yeah. 
And can you talk a little bit now? You uh, are your territory is uh, kidding on ZD, am I correct? So can you talk a little bit about the impact of those uh, boil water advisories? Because it's not just that um, area, it's so many of our uh, territories across Canada are impacted by that. Yeah, so with the, the water sectors, there's actually a different sector within AFN that deals with infrastructure that, uh, that handles all of the, the water boil advisories across Canada. Um, but it is it is a major issue uh, throughout a lot of our First Nations where we don't have access to clean drinking water. Uh, and it comes from a variety of different reasons from infrastructure to uh, just not having the, the correct mechanisms in place to be able to to put those those plants in or to upkeep and maintain. Um, uh, again, it's it, it's kind of all over the place. Um, different reasons that they're occurring. And I see Josh nodding there, so that must be a, a major part of the work that you do as well. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, if, if Josh is still there, I don't see him on my screen, but um, we had a question come up from uh, in the chat. Um, uh, about something that uh, you mentioned. How much do the temporary housing costs uh, and how does it provide energy and water? Hi, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, so the, the temp housings that um, are installed for the residents on site, um, they actually were um, purchased um, through the Government of Canada through a contract and they were delivered up through the states um, a couple of months ago, so they're they're full housing. They're much better than the apartment that I that I live in um, out in Ottawa. Um, and we actually got to install utilities, so they have running water now. They have running electricity because before um, the only infrastructure that was left on site was what was left over from the old military base. So of course, um, all of that is a little bit off grid um, and. They were not supposed to be turned on, but of course, people need heating, people need water, we need electricity to uh, to live. And um, what makes me really proud is seeing um, as like the temp housings uh, keep getting installed, people are getting um, fencing put around. They're getting they're getting their own yards. They're getting um, satellite dishes for you know television for internet, and um, they're getting utilities that is helping to raise like um, their quality of life on site because this this is their land right and um any way we can help I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of thank you um now the next line of questioning that i'm going to get into so all of you career panelists think uh think about it because you never know when i'm going to call on you um is i, I want to hear about like our audience here are high school students so I want to hear about some of the experiences that you had in high school that may have helped form your path. They may not be directly related, but um, I know some of you have done some co-op co -op work placements you mentioned, and um, others may have run their own businesses um, in different areas. So I'd like to, to go around the table and hear about if you have any uh, experiences in high school, be it co-op, part-time jobs, um, businesses that, that you ran that um, may be related or maybe they're unrelated to what you do today. And But w what was the learning that, that came from whatever it is that, that you did? So um, Patty, we already know you, you, did, you volunteered when you were um, 16 because you couldn't volunteer <laughs> with the with the with the uh, organization uh, before you were 16. Did you have any other? Well, you you mentioned your co-op experience. What was that like, and and did it influence what you're doing now? 
Yeah, I think I think co-op, um, if that's a consideration for people, is a wonderful way to try out a career uh, that you think you might like without actually having to commit to it. Because you know, not to say that when you apply for university, you're really committing to anything, but that's at the point where you you know you're going to have to start investing in in your university. So I took any opportunity I could to try out different uh, places. Again, as I mentioned, I was so set on I'm going to be a vet because you know, the, the blinders are on. You don't really realize how many potential careers there are. Uh, so I did work part-time at a veterinary clinic. I did do high school co-op at another veterinary clinic. Uh, I was volunteering at the bird center. Uh, so it was all animal related to get experience, which is, is another thing, right? You want to try to get experience to, to build your resume and things like that. So although volunteering doesn't pay in money, uh, it does pay in a lot of experience that's very valuable on uh, high school or university college applications. Um, I was able to obtain a lot of scholarships uh, because of my volunteering work. Um, and I just try to focus it on on areas that I thought I would like. And it, it really kind of opens your eyes and you meet people, right? And you get to hear their stories, just like you're hearing today. Um, all of our stories, it's not what we thought we were going to do. It, it you, we, The road is like this, right? So the more people you're able to meet in the field, and talk to your eyes will be open to all of these possibilities um, for your future so I, I highly encourage co-ops and and volunteering when you can thanks Patty um, Micah how about you I know some of the things you were involved in in, in high school and um, you're a, you're an entrepreneur as well can you tell us a little bit about what some of the things you were involved in while you were in high school yeah for sure um, so during high school, uh, the robotics club at our school was something I was quite interested in. Um, so that was a couple afternoons uh, during the school week. I'd go into classroom at Glebe and play around with some uh, Arduinos and some electronic circuits to get a feel for that. Um, and through that, I kind of got interested in electronics as more more general. Um, so I, as Christy mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my own business. Um, I started um, reselling electronic components uh, in the Ottawa area. Uh, so as I was getting into this stuff, I wanted to get more components um, and see where I could buy them from. And locally, there weren't many options to buy them, uh, or they were very expensive. So I bought some elsewhere and imported them and started to resell them locally in Ottawa. Um, so my business is called A2D Electronics. Um, and it's a site that sells electronic components to hobbyists and uh, other makers in the Ottawa community uh, that are interested in trying to like play around with this stuff and see what they can make. Um, and through that, there was a bunch of uh, people that I got connected with. Uh, there are a bunch of makers groups in the Ottawa area. Uh, so Makerspace North or Hack 613, there's like a bunch of groups of people that just come together and make stuff. Um, so that was pretty cool. And another thing that I volunteered at during high school was Robot Missions. Uh, and they're an organization um, that is aiming to educate people about uh, robotics and how it can be used to help the environment. Um, so there is beach cleanup days at the, I think it was the Westboro Beach, uh, where we go out, they'd have their robot and they'd put it out on the sand. And um, the robot would look for stuff like cigarette butts and it would use a little scooper and pick it up and put it in the bin on the back. And then as um, that robot was out, people would come up and then ask questions and uh, they'd have their turn to pilot the robot as well to pick stuff up. So that was super cool to be involved in that as well. Micah, um, that is incredibly cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Christina is nodding as well. Honestly, that is just, I wish I had been there to see it. Uh, there was a question that was put in the chat. Does Tesla offer any volunteer experience opportunities for students uh, in Ottawa or around? Uh, to my knowledge, I don't know. Uh, but I'm sure that it's something that they'd be interested in. I, I'm not sure. We can uh, reach out to them and find it. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. They're yeah. very particular about the caliber of uh, people they take in. So <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they do do quite a bit of outreach at university campuses as well. Um, so at uh, the University of Waterloo, um, I'm on a student design team, and we're building a solar electric vehicle. Um, and that's kind of how Tesla got connected uh, with the Waterloo campus through the student design teams. 
very cool. And as you guys can see, um, it's all of these little things that that people take part in, whether it's a club, a group, uh, an association, or whatever, to explore different opportunities that lead to more and more opportunities. Um, I know it's really difficult during these tough times, but it's really still really important to get out there and connect with people, even if it's even if it's virtual. Um, we still have uh, some other panelists. I want to know from hear from Luke, Joshua, and Jamie. Um, maybe some things that you guys did in high school that uh, shaped or helped shape what what career path you're on today. So Luke, are you there? Yeah, sure, I can jump in. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. Yeah, so I mean, um, some of the stuff I'm gonna say is gonna echo what you know Patty was saying about volunteering. Um, I did something very similar where I volunteered at a local wildlife rehab center when I was in high school as well. Um, and since then have had many different hats on there. Um, you know, starting out as sort of the intern that's there for, you know, six weeks. Um, so a couple of years later, I ended up going back and being the education coordinator for um, the entire organization. Um, but some other things that I did in high school would have been um, volunteer coaching is a great um, a great thing that looks great, great on your resume. Um, and camp counseling was also something that I did as well, because uh, that teach you, teaches you a lot of really good uh, leadership skills, uh, a lot of great um, transitional skills that can really apply to um, school or to work, really. Um, and then the way that I kind of made money in high school was actually I really wanted to find a job that I enjoyed doing at a young age um, with no qualifications. Where you could get dirty, where you could get dirty. Yes, yes, I loved being outdoors. I knew that about myself and I loved being active and just being uh, doing some sort of exercise. So I actually ended up starting up my own landscaping company um, that just kind of grew a year by year. And so it just started out by, you know, mowing a couple lawns uh, on my street and then eventually grew into having to like hire my brother and hire a couple friends. Um, and we had this, you know, landscaping business that was working on maybe 50 lawns over the course of a summer. Uh, so that was pretty fun. And it was a really good experience because it taught me a lot of uh, really good business skills. Um, and again, just responsibility and uh, work ethic and all those sorts of things, which really helped me. Um, it's not something that I wanted to pursue as like a long term career. It was just something that combined a couple of my different interests into um, something that I realized that I could do in my community. Um, and so I, I said I did that. Um, yeah, I guess just yeah, volunteer wherever you can. Uh, look for those opportunities that are out there, whether it's an internship. Um, and if there's no opportunities out there, uh, like Mika, don't be afraid to create those opportunities as well, right? Um, because that also looks really good uh, when you're applying for jobs and things. It really shows a lot of work ethic and uh, creativity and initiative and all those great things. Luke, would you say that a sense of curiosity and inquiry is is an incredibly important um, skill or attribute for uh, people who are looking at this kind of career? Definitely. I mean, I, I would say that, that that curiosity or that sense of curiosity is what drives you to, to want to get into the weeds and, you know, get deeper into that subject that you're curious about. Um, and, and I find that's really, it can pay off big time later on in life where, you know, I did camp counseling when I was in high school and then sort of went the science route when I went to university. But then it was, you know, maybe five years after I had been a camp counselor that I was like, okay, education was actually something that I really enjoyed doing. And it kind of came back from the past. Um, so yeah, never be afraid to be, be, be curious um, because that can help you narrow in on what exactly you might want to do uh, and, you know, what makes you feel fulfilled in life. Yeah, because your comment earlier uh, certainly resonated with me when you were talking about the ants going over the log and why do they go one by one over that log? And I thought, you know, that is something that will spur you into whole other worlds. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, and uh, I guess like one other thing that I could share as well is sort of about that transition going from being interested in science to um, education really what it came down to is when I was doing some co-op experiences in university, um, I was doing some field research um, one year with Parks Canada, another year with Bird Studies Canada. 
and I really loved the work and I, I loved being outdoors. Um, you know, that's, that's my cup of tea being outside under the sunshine. Um, but yeah, it was just, it didn't quite feel like it was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and maybe I felt like I could have a bit of a bigger impact, uh, trying to help the environment somebody somewhere else. So that's when I kind of made a pivot and thought, you know, there's so many great scientists out there that are so smart and doing amazing research and work. But where I felt like I might be more useful was in helping to relay or communicate that science to the general public in an understandable way. And so that's where I sort of found my niche was in, I loved the science, I loved learning about it, but I thought that maybe communicating and um, relaying that, that sort of um, jargony science information might be a little more useful to, uh, the, to the general public and hopefully have a bigger, a bigger, bigger impact. And that's not an easy skill. I mean, and it's helpful for the common person who's, you know, trying to learn more about the world around them um, and just to have an understanding and appreciation for what's going on. I was listening to a podcast yesterday uh, with David Eagleman, who's a neuroscientist, and one of the things that they were lauding him for and saying how great he was about was the fact that he could write about science um, issues and concerns in an understandable way so that the, the regular public could get a better understanding of their world. And I think that's what you do. Exactly. Yeah, if we can help folks care more about wildlife and about habitats uh, and be more aware of what's going on to them and what's, uh, what's happening with climate change, if you can connect people to that and connect people to nature and, and make them aware of some of those issues, then I find that's where sort of the next gradual step is going to be to care about some of those things and to want to do something about them. But education is definitely that first step. Well, Luke, uh, judging from what we've heard from you today, you're pretty good at your job. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Jamie, um, I have a couple questions for you. One, did you do anything in high school that may have helped shape your career path? My story might be a little bit different from the others, um, being that I, I guess I didn't discover that until later in life. Um, so when I was in school, I had probably close to zero interest in science class or any kind of anything to do with with science. Uh, I just wanted to get in, get out, and that's all I wanted to do. But um, when I actually got into the field and I was working in insurance, that's when it kind of hit me. And I realized that this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Not knocking that field, by the way, if there's anyone listening that that is in it, it, it can be great, but uh, just wasn't for me. So yeah, I guess in that way, um, made me realize that I need to, to go back to school and, and do something different. And then that's when I actually got into to what I wanted to do. It, it sounds like you have a calling. And um, I know that Indigenous peoples play a, a special role in fighting climate change. And I'm just wondering if it, if it's, you, is it uh, maybe a mentor or uh, part of your culture that drew you to what you're doing now? Um, how, how did you rediscover your interests after having taken a few years before going back to school? I think it was really um, when I attended Haskell University in Kansas that really kind of struck, it's like I'm having these, these different moments in my life that are kind of bringing me into that realization of what I need to do. So um, like number one, when I went back to school and I, I did uh, the undergrad in, in science, uh, and then I didn't even really connect it at that point with Indigenous people. It was just when I went to Kansas and I sat down and I listened to all these wonderful people across uh, North America. And there was even people there from, from New Zealand that were talking about Indigenous youth in STEM that I kind of realized at that point that I wanted to, to work with my people and to help my people. Because um, in all honesty, growing up, I grew up in Northern Ontario and um, I guess I'm I'm one of those indigenous peoples that grew up not really knowing too much about my culture. So I'm only I only reconnected to my indigenous roots uh, at a later stage as well. 
Jamie, um, I know that having been uh, blessed with ha- being able to attend a water walk once in my life, that this is something that perhaps our students might get involved in. Um, is Are there people in the Ottawa area that can facilitate that so that our students can uh, look at uh, water from perhaps that more traditional uh, First Nations view? I'm not aware of um, any organizations in Ottawa that presently do that. That is something that I am looking to start uh, within AFN and have that not only within Ottawa, but I want to do that across Canada with our regional offices. So um, I'm definitely, you know, willing. Oh, I think you froze there, Jamie, unless it's my own uh, system. Um, so just to, oh, you're back. Fantastic. Uh, so when we had our water walk, um, it was uh, held by, I believe, a traditional teacher in the area, Marlene Soulier, uh, ran our water walk, and, and it was quite an experience for us, and it felt um, almost sacred to be part of that opportunity. So I do encourage any educators who, who have the chance to, to think about um, exploring water more, um, and groups like AFN that Jamie is a part of are such an incredible resource to, uh, to learn from, and it sounds like it's going to absolutely continue to grow. Christina, we're about, believe it or not, seven minutes out-ish. I'm going to, because we could spill over a couple extra minutes maybe uh, from the end of our, our time together, depending on uh, our panelists. But uh, um, I think we need to hear more about Indigo. What do you think? <laughs> Sounds good. So Patty, could you, this morning we got quite a bit of information about uh, caring with Indigo and you were talking uh, about also a lot of the different animals who come through your center because I don't think our students realize how many different kinds of birds and, and just the sheer quantity of birds that come through the Ottawa Wildlife, uh, Ottawa Valley Wild Bird Care Center. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, um, Indigo's looking down because he's like, oh, now it's my, my time for treats, right? <sighs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, as always, get rewarded. Uh, one of the questions this morning was, uh, Indigo's so quiet, he never makes any noise. And we, of course, we're all so familiar with, you know, birds giving us that beautiful song in the morning, but uh, Indigo does not have a beautiful song. So I work on my impersonation because I can't make him say a noise, but uh, an American Kestrel kind of sounds like a ay, 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 uh, noise. Uh, so he doesn't need to make noise unless he's trying to attract um, a female or if he sees something out the window that he might be a fear of. So each year we do take in over 4,000 birds. Uh, last year was a record number of birds for us, and we do think that is because of COVID. Not to say more birds are getting hurt, but more people have gone outside. More people have been like, oh my goodness, there's wildlife out here. So more people were finding birds. Uh, we do not have a pickup or rescue service, so all the birds are brought to us, which makes my job very interesting. We care for over 120 different species of birds, ranging from hummingbirds all the way up to bald eagles. Uh, so that's a really cool part of the job. And uh, we do get birds that uh, we shouldn't see here. So in 1997, uh, Ottawa had a flamingo, <laughs> believe it or not, that flew the wrong way and ended up on the shorelines of the Ottawa River. So that's our, our rarest and most famous bird that we've cared for. Um, but we have had a puffin and other, other birds that have kind of followed the waterways from the ocean, um, maybe after a hurricane or something and got lost. So we do work with other rehab centers and actually have to put these birds on a plane to get back to where they came from, to get back to their, their natural habitat. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool job, and I, I mean, I've been there for many, many, many years, and I s still am interested every day when I go, because there's always surprises, and I'm always learning. Uh, so that's that's what I like most about my job. <laughs> Sorry, Indigo, for interrupting your, your lunch. Um, there's so much... There's so much career advice for high school students that, that you guys have to offer. Um, I know one of uh, another kind of 
piece of advice for those of you interested in uh, careers in this area um, might come directly from Luke because he's he's directly involved in a program for students your age. So Luke, maybe you could tell tell us a little bit more about um, the program that you're involved in for for 15 to 18 year olds. And Luke has kindly put some um, uh, links in the chat. So educators, please do check those out uh, before you sign off today. Yes, thanks for the reminder there. That was actually uh, good timing. Um, so I posted two links in the chat there, uh, and it's for two programs that the Canadian Wildlife Federation offers, um, which are classified as youth leadership programs. So they're all about developing those leadership skills in young Canadians like yourselves. And so we've started out or started out with the Wild Outside program, uh, which is about a year old now, and that is a program for 15 to 18 year olds. So that should be hopefully within the age range for most of the folks on this call. Um, but there is a group in Ottawa um, where, where we have this program running in about 14 cities across the country. So it is a national program, um, but we are running a, a group in the Ottawa region where we have two, they're called youth leadership specialists. And so there are uh, employees there that help plan and lead um, outdoor events. So they could be taking you hiking or biking or canoeing or kayaking, or if it's the winter, you could go snowshoeing. So they take you on a bunch of outdoor uh, adventures in your city. And then there's also service projects as well. So uh, you get to do some tree planting or trail maintenance or uh, building bat boxes or um, bird houses, a bunch of stuff like that. So you get to really make sure that you're giving back to your community as well. Um, and it's sort of an extracurricular program. So it's outside of school. Um, you just attend events when you can. Um, and you can earn service hours through this. And then if you earn 120 service hours, then you become a program alumni. You can put it on your resume and it looks really, really good uh, to go through a program like that. And then there is another program that I posted a link for, for anyone that's graduating uh, or anyone that's 18 years old. So this is called the Canadian Conservation Corps. And this is our uh, sort of big sister program to Wild Outside. Um, it started back in 2018. And it really focuses on um, developing those personal and professional skills to get young folks um, uh, skilled and interested in working in conservation, essentially. Um, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do when you sign up for the program, or you don't have to have uh, a, a university degree or anything. Um, we've had lots of folks come right out of high school, but that's a program where you essentially get to participate in doing some training, um, you get certified in first aid, you get to do a two week uh, a backcountry expedition with Outward Bound Canada, and you get to do a three month work placement with a local or a, um, a partner organization of CWFs, and that could be anywhere in Canada. So you could get to do some traveling across Canada with the Canadian Conservation Corps, uh, whereas Wild Outside is based directly around your city. So that'll be just based around Ottawa. Um, but if you're interested in either of those programs, definitely check out those links and you can apply online. And if you'd like to know any more, uh, you can definitely send me some questions after this session. Thank you very much. Um, I do see that we we have hit our 1 p.m. Um, time. Uh, I know I could go on listening to, to you guys talk and uh, for, for the rest of the afternoon, but I know students have to go back to their, their other work now. Um, is there any last piece of advice or anything that uh, any of the crew panelists would like to offer? Oh, Indigo, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Micah, I'd love to hear from you for a, a last piece of advice because you're, you're close in age to uh, many of the students that are on the line today. What, what's one thing that uh, you would advise either your, your younger self or the people who are out there thinking about a career that, that relates to uh, creativity or to the environment? Yeah, for sure. Um, the, I think the main thing, as Luke pointed out earlier, uh, is just being curious about uh, what you see out in the world. Uh, so whether that's being curious about uh, Anton Log or being curious about why this electric circuit behaves this way. Um, and then being able to dive down into the weeds and try and figure out um, like the, the first principles behind it. Um, because pretty much everything that um, you can see can be related back to simple laws. Um, 
So for example, electricity, Ohm's law is something that you might learn in your science class. Um, and so much uh, is related to that, that having a really good understanding of that is awesome. So really to understand the first principles and to be able to apply those to a wide variety of situations. Um, that'd probably be my advice. Thank you very much. On that note, um, I think we're going to have to say adieu to all of our wonderful career panelists. Thank you once again on behalf of JA and ONFI and the Ottawa Catholic School Board uh, for joining us today in this uh, exploration of your careers and on this very special Earth Day. Special thanks go out to, to Jamie for that uh, inspiring keynote. Absolutely. And thank you, Christina, for all your hard work uh, on behalf of JA on ONFI for organizing with us this career panel. You make it so easy. Uh, we really appreciate all that you've done to uh, help our students learn a little bit more about career exploration and to line up such an incredible group of panelists. Uh, thanks also to Jennifer Goche, who's been working the chat today and letting people in and, and posting and letting us know about questions. So huge thank you to everybody today and our students for uh, some, some great uh, questions as well that have come your way. So. Kudos to Anfi and a huge uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you for hosting.